Okay. Okay, we've been doing for a while a series of two teachings because there's been a lot. There's a lot to cover at the season. Um, today's portion is called Nikes. Last week, we, uh, we were talking about Joseph. Okay. We began to go over the life of Joseph and how it represents, his life represents the first and the second coming. Okay. Um, so this week, last week was about how his life represents the first coming and how he suffered. And how he was tossed into a pit by his brothers. And then he was sold into Egypt. Yeshua was taken, mistreated by the Yehudim, by the Jews, and then given over to the Gentiles, who then killed him. Okay? So, if what Yosef suffered was a type and shadow of what Yeshua suffered. However, also in the life of Yosef is, is a symbolic, beautiful symbolic picture of his second coming. And we're going to begin to talk about that today. It's in this week's portion and next week's portion. So, Miketz. What does Miketz mean? <clears throat> it's, in, it's in the very beginning of the Torah portion on Genesis 40, page, uh, Genesis chapter 41, verse 1. It says now, this is what it says. By he Viketz Shinatai Yamim Uf Ufaro. Okay, I'll just this those four words, the five words is what I read. But it actually the whole verse means it was at the end of two years of days. Pharaoh was dreaming, and he beheld that he was standing over the river. Now, it's very interesting how they put this. It was at the end of two years of days. What that tells you is, remember, we're going by God's calendar. We're not going by January to December. Okay? So based on this calendar, before, now you've got to remember, this was before the calendar had changed. So what calendar were we using? We were using the calendar beginning with Rosh Hashanah, which is around September, October time frame. So it was at the end of this two years of period. Of period. So that tells us that it was Rosh Hashanah Yom Teruah when this happened. At the end. But also there's something else being said here. The end is the word Meketz. And if you take Remove the men out of it. It's the word kets, which is a term for the end. The end of all time. The end of everything. We are waiting right now for the end day. We're not waiting for the end of days. We, well, we are sort of. But we're not waiting for the end days. We have been in the end days since 500 years before Yeshua came. Okay. Because I, t I shared this before. If you, if you take a week, everybody in the world knows that on hump day, you are now descending from the week. You, you had the first three and a half days, and now, yeah, the week gets coming. Okay? And you know it on hump day. They even have a camel on TV. <laughs> the, the, the talks of that hump day, get it, hump, camel, you know, hump day. Well, hump day begins the last days of the week. And so we have been in the last days because according to the Bible, and Psalm 90 verse 4 and 2 Peter 3 verse 8, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. So there is a 7,000 year period for all of mankind. God even told that to Noah. To Noah. He said that that uh, I will not deal with flesh. He says, they have 120 years. That's it. Now, you might say, yes, it was 120 years before the flood came, but it was more than that. When God speaks, it means that something present is about to happen and something in the future is about to happen. God's prophecy is now and in the future, always. Because he's keep, 
He's a storyteller, and he's telling us a story through the prophets. He's telling us over and over again so that we'll know what's going to happen at the very end. Okay, so, he, so, it, so prophecy is now and in the future. And the prophecy that we're talking about here is, in this case, is the end of a two-day period, or no, a two-year period, okay? So let's call it, for, for example, a day is just a thousand years, right? Let's call it 2,000 years, at the end of 2,000 years. What's going to happen at the end of 2,000 years, or toward the end of 2,000 years? We are going to have a period of tribulation followed by a period of great tribulation. A total period of seven years. Okay, so what happened here is Pharaoh has a dream, and the set, he has a dream of seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of disaster, seven, seven years of, of famine. Let's look at it. Okay, so was he at the end? It was at the end of two years of days. Pharaoh was dreaming, and he beheld that he was standing over the river. And when he beheld that out of the river were coming out seven cows, beautiful of appearance and robust of flesh, and they were grazing in the marshland, then he beheld seven other cows coming up after them out of the river, ugly of appearance and gaunt of flesh, and they stood next to the cows. On the bank of the river, they ate to the cows, ugly of appearance and gone of flesh. The seven beautiful cows of appearance, which were robust, and Pharaoh awoke, and he fell asleep, and he dreamed the second time, and behold, seven ears of grain were sprouting up on a single stalk, healthy and good. And behold, seven ears of grain, thin and scorched by the east wind, were growing after them. And they swallowed up to the ears that were thin, the seven ears that were healthy, and that were full. And Pharaoh awoke, and indeed, it had been a dream. And he's, he was agitated, and he asked for all the soothsayers and the prophecy people, not the believers in Yeshua, but the pagan idolaters who used to use the art of psychic and necromancy and all these different things to find a result. But they didn't think to to send for Joseph, because no one knew about Joseph. He was in prison. However, remember the story that we did last week, the cupbearer and the baker, okay? And the baker, the, they, someone had stolen the cup from Pharaoh, and it was found out, and Joseph interpreted the dreams that both of them had, and it happened exactly as Joseph interpreted them. The baker died, was, was killed, was hung, while the cupbearer was re, re, returned. And Joseph asked the cupbearer, will you please remember me? Because I, I don't belong in jail. I didn't do anything wrong. But the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. But he then is going to apologize to Pharaoh. He says, I, no one can help Pharaoh. And, and they all want to help him because they know if they get good graces before Pharaoh, they'll, they'll be rewarded. But no one wanted to help him. Okay, so then the cupbearer apologizes to Pharaoh. I, I need to apologize. When you properly judge your servants, when, you know, when, when, when there was a, an incident, I was uh, the baker that was the one who, who was, he was the one that was uh, unfaithful. He was the one that stole from you, and he was judged righteously, and so was the cup bearer. I was restored back, and there was a man in prison who did this, who told me I had, we both had dreams, and he properly interpreted the dream. So he brought that back, and he told the Pharaoh, it was a Jewish man, it was a, a Hebrew man, actually, a Hebrew man that was in the prison who properly interpreted our dreams, okay? So that so that so they go back and they get him out. So let, let's let's go up to that. Now I told you right now there were seven years of you know the, they were told that there were seven good cows, seven good ears. They were eaten up by seven bad cows and seven bad 
years, okay? These are seven years, and we're, and we're going to find out this is how it's interpreted by Yosef. These are actually seven years, but you know what? They, they, they actually need each other, those seven years. They, the seven years of plenty need the seven years of famine. The seven years of famine need the seven years of plenty. Actually, it's better probably to say the seven years of famine need the seven years of plenty. But the seven years of plenty come first. They are one. There's the seven years. And this is going to be the last act. The last act, you could say, before the coming of Messiah. There's going to be seven years of tribulation and great tribu tribulation that's going to come to the, to the earth. It's going to begin on a Rosh Hashanah, just as Joseph is about to be pulled out of prison. So let's move over to that. The reason why I'm going so fast is I'm actually giving you more of a summary of what happened so, so we can get to also the second teaching that we have today. Okay. Um, so Joseph told Pharaoh that there was seven years of abundance coming. He, he was all, <laughs> I, I'd probably be better off if I just read it. Go to, uh, go to page two of your notes. And in chapter 41, 14, Pharaoh sent for and called for Yosef. They rushed him from the pit. He shaved changed his clothes, and he came to Pharaoh. When did this happen? It happened on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah. Okay, now remember what God's going to do, what Messiah is going to do. He's going to come. He's going to sound the shofar, right? And we are going to be changed. And we're going to go, and we're going to have our clothes changed. We're going to be shaved. We're going to have a whole new body, and we're going to go to be with the Lord. Okay. This is what happens on Rosh Hashanah Yom Teruah. This is what happened to Joseph. But he was being raised from the lowest place, a pit. But you know what? There's, there's something very interesting. There's a revelation in this. He was actually in the house of, he lived in the house of the, of the one who, con, who controlled the prison. He didn't live in the prison. He didn't sleep in the prison. He lived in the house of the one who, who was over the prisoners. He was a servant to him, but he was blessed, Joseph. Even though he was put in prison, uh, the, the prison guard knew he was blessed. So he, he ended up staying in his house. But why does it, it say in the, in the Hebrew, it, if you look at, at the word for pit, it says here, Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph. Now calling means shouting out loud. What is sent? He said the, uh, what is it? The shofar and the shout of the Lord when Messiah comes. And, and he's rushed from the pit. Well, the pit here, the word is bore. It literally means, it really means sister or well or dungeon. But if he was sent from the house of, of the one who, who, who owns the prison, who takes care of the prison, why is it called a pit? Because it's a type of shadow. In the Hebrew, it's revealed. He's coming from the lowest place, and he's coming up. Now also Yeshua, when he died and went to the cross, he was in the war. Hell. He went and he took away the power of the enemy, the keys of the enemy. He went down there and he brought up a bunch of people with him. Okay, so he went to the pit too. And also us, we get to go. We're, I mean, in, in a sense, this is our pit, the earth. But we're, we're waiting for our, the day of our, the resurrection. And it's going to happen on Rosh Hashanah. Because of the words in this story of Joseph, it's going to happen to all of us. There's another scripture that actually says that it talks about a testimony in Joseph. And I, I didn't plan on, on sharing that one, uh, but I think it's in Psalm 81. 
Let me just check real quick. Uh, okay, maybe not Psalm 81. Well, there's a prophecy that talks about a testimony in Joseph that that at the concealed moon, we blow the shofar at the concealed moon. You know where that might be, Josh? Blow the shofar at the concealed moon, it says, as a testimony is in Joseph. Because the only time a shofar is blown at the concealed moon, it could be the beginning of every month, but it, there's only one festival, because it actually says a festival in that same passage. There's only one festival on a new moon where the shofar is blown, and that is Rosh Hashanah Yom Teruah. Yes, Josh? Verse 3. Okay, I missed it. Sorry about that. Psalm 81. I guess when you're sort of in a rush a little bit, like I just was in a rush. Okay, there it is. Love the shofar at the new moon, at the, at the, now it says in your Bible, full moon, it's not correct. It's the concealed moon. It's not a full moon, it's a concealed moon. If you look at it up in the Hebrew, it'll confirm it. When they translated that, the Gentiles really don't know the difference between full or concealed or new. It's a new moon on our feast day. There's only one feast day that has a new moon that we blow the shofar, it's Yom Teruah. And it's a testimony, oh, I forgot to read that part. It's a testimony in Yosef. Okay, guys, yeah, in Psalm 81, and you might wonder, it says here, here we go, for it is a statue for Israel, an ordinance for the God of Yaakov, he established it for a testimony in Yosef, when he went throughout the land of Egypt, I heard a language that I did not know, okay, but, but look at this, he established it as a testimony in Yosef, this is, this is the name of Joseph, okay, his his life, even the very time that he was taken to Egypt is, is, the, is when Yeshua came the first time and was mistreated by his brothers and mistreated by Egypt or the Gentiles. When he comes the second time, it's, it's a whole different thing. He is coming to rule and reign. He is coming and there's, he's not coming as a lamb. He's coming as a lion. But Yosef right now is, is, a, is on the ground. He's in the prison and he's being raised up. So he can't be talking about Yeshua. It is talking about his resurrection from, from the day of his resurrection. But it's more talking about us as believers because of the timing of it being on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah. So if people say, well, he can't come back on Yom Teruah, that's wrong. He's coming for his bride on Yom Teruah, and it's testified here in Joseph, in the life of Joseph. So he calls, he sends for first, who sent Messiah and the archangel with a trumpet call of God and the dead of Messiah arise. It's right here. So Joseph has his clothes changed. Well, what do our clothes represent? Our cover. God is our, our covering is our flesh, but it's also in him. So it, it's time to get a new flesh. It's time to rise up. He's, be, he's coming from the lowest place and he's coming to, to be right under Pharaoh to interpret his dreams. And his inter interpretation is those dreams that I read to you earlier are about seven years of blessing or prosperity in the land, followed by seven years of famine. And he advises Pharaoh to save up a fifth of the produce during the years of blessing to be, to be eaten on the years of famine. Okay, this is where we get Joseph's storehouse and we get all these different things. Store during the good times for the bad times. But this is really very amazing. And because he is now, he's, he goes from the lowest place and, and Pharaoh recognizes that God is with him. God is with Joseph. So who better to do this
Ben Joseph, to oversee this collection of food. So he makes a second in command of all of Egypt, which represents the whole world. Who is second in command of, of the whole universe and everything? Yeshua. The, the father is all in all. Yeshua is his son. The overseer, all authority was given to him under heaven and earth. So Yosef is a type and shadow of that. He goes from the lowest place to being, to being not at the highest place. And God is going to take us when the time comes where they'll be killing believers and take us up to be to be rule and reign over the earth with Messiah. Okay, so, so this is pretty exciting here. You can see the resurrection in this. Okay, let's let's move on. Uh, you know, what are the meanings that they that they said? Um, in chapter 41, verse 15. Actually, they give them a name, right? But right before that, this is what it says. Look at verse 42. Power removed, uh, chapter 41, Genesis 41, verse 42. Power removed his ring from upon his hand and put it on the hand of Yosef. He then dressed him in garments of fine linen and he placed a chain of gold around his neck and he had he had him ride on the royal chariot that was secondary to the one that was his. And they proclaimed before him, Aflech! They went and they proclaimed before, before Joseph, Yosef, Aflech. But what does Aflech mean? Have you ever looked at that and wondered what, what were they saying? We're on the bottom of page three now of the notes. The word Aflech literally means to kneel. Remember the scripture says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Yeshua is king? Well, this is Avrech. Avrech. Yosef was given all authority and, and received a ring that contained paro or paro's royal seal as a type of kingship just under the pharaoh. He was dressed in garments of fine linen. He rode high on the royal chariot. They proclaimed Avrek, which means father of the king. Now think about this. He was called father of the king. Now th th this is much deeper than any of us know. Breaking it down, Av in Hebrew means father, while Rech in Aramaic means king. In Rosh Hashanah Yom Teruah, we rehearse the coming of the Messianic kingdom by singing Avinu Malkeinu, which means our father, our king. So we're singing this song every Rosh Hashanah Yom Teruah, Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king. And here all of Egypt is rehearsing the coming of the kingdom of Messiah by saying Avrech. <laughs> Bow the knee. But it, it also means the father of the king, or the king and the father. Okay, so it also means a shout, like the shout of and for a king, like the shofar blast that will sound the coming of the sign to gather his bride and physically return. The shout of a king. So we, we have Aurech, and then he's given a new name, Zaphanat Panea. Can you all try that? Tzaf, Tzaf, not. Ha'anea. That's how, how you say it. These are some of the names of the, this is Joseph's new name given to him. It, Zafinat Tzafna. That's a T-S. Or a T-Z. Tzafna Panea. It means treasury of, of the glorious rest. Another term for the kingdom. It also means savior of the world in the Septuagint. And, and guess what else it means? Revealer of secrets. Who reveals secrets like our God does? So all these names, all this is what Zafnat Panea means. It's all a term for Messiah and for our God. And he was married to As, Asnat. Asnat, what you can do for your country? No. Asnat. Okay. 
So, uh, asnat uh, in Hebrew means belonging to the goddess Nid. Okay. Okay. Now, this is this is literally what it means in the in Egyptian. He who was consecrated to Nid, the goddess of wisdom. Now, let me explain something to us. It, As Asan, the first part of her name means a storehouse. Okay. Now, this is the bride. Okay. We belong to the enemy until the Messiah comes. We are sold out to the enemy until Messiah comes into our lives and saves us. So it's like we are servants of false gods until the time comes when Messiah comes into our lives and saves us and we are now his. So you could say Asanat represent or Asanat represents us. We are the bride, and it's the bride of Joseph. Joseph. As, as the mess that we are, as the mess that she was, she was probably saved by hearing all the stories from Joseph about the true God. Think about that. That's God has saved us. You have been brought close to a Jewish Messiah, to, to the ways of Israel, all of us. Okay, then during the good years, they collect all the, the extra, you know, the, 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 the fifth of, of the produce for the bad years, during the good years. And then during that time, Yosef has two children. The first one is Menashe. We're on the bottom of page four. Menashe is symbolic of Messiah's first coming who suffered, to suffer at the hands of his brothers. Now, why is that? Because... When he names him, it's on the next page. When he names him, Menashe, the first word son, it means causing to forget, to forget, to deprive. He didn't have his family, so God has caused me to forget the pain of losing my family. So it's when Messiah was cut off, it says in Daniel, he was cut off not for himself. He was cut off. So... Menashe is symbolic of the suffering of Messiah. Ephraim means doubly blessed. Doubly fruitful is actually what it means. Okay, so, so Ephraim literally means to be fruitful, to branch off. Okay, so, so here's the hope that God will bring much fruit. Okay, in other words, the two sons of Yosef are first, their suffering of Messiah. Second, he will be doubly fruitful, greatly fruitful. That's the Messiah and the work of Messiah in the earth. But guess what? It also was something else. It's the first son, Menashe, was means cut off, or you know, basically uh, maybe to forget could be the, the scattering of the tribes of Israel when they were scattered out of the land. And then having another son, Menashe, means that it's it's bringing all the children of Israel back. So there's there's multiple meanings here. Okay, uh, I'm not going to you know go in, into it. It represents it could represent the two thousand years of of being in exile that Israel was in exile. I hope I haven't lost any of you. But anyhow, so the famine reaches Israel two years into the years of famine. We're now on the bottom of page five. Okay, so we went through the seven years of blessing. They were collecting the grains. Okay, and he had two children. And by the way, there's also a whole story about the life of Judah in here. Uh, which we're not going to actually, they, we spoke, they were spoken about last week, so we're not going to talk about that. Okay, and then, um, so now comes the famine. And during the famine years, Israel hears, and this is Israel, Yaakov, who's in Israel, hears that there's food during a time of great famine that's affecting everyone. There's food in Egypt. So he sends his sons, except for Benjamin, because he says, I lost Joseph, I'm not going to lose Benjamin. So he sends all of his sons 
to go and, and buy grain in Egypt. And they get there. And immediately, Yosef, Joseph, recognizes them. And, but they don't recognize him. Why? Because he looked like he was an Egyptian. He had great authority. And he had gold around him. And he didn't look like an Israeli. He didn't look like one of the brothers. They didn't recognize him. And in this whole process, they bow down to him. Remember the prophecy, the dream that was given to Joseph that all his brothers would bow down to him? That was getting fulfilled. Okay, so, uh, you know, this is what happens. Two years into it, but Joseph has to test them. He has to see if their hearts changed. Because you know how long it's been? He was, uh, he was, he was, his cloak was taken from him. He was put in the pit by his brothers when he was 17. He became chancellor of Egypt, or I just say, second in all of power in Egypt when he was 30. How many years has passed by? Nine years. Seven years of plenty and two years of the famine. So let's take nine years and add it to 30. He's about 39 or maybe 40. And here comes his brothers. Okay, so he has to test them. Well, what is 40? It's the number of testing. It's a number of testing, and he has to test his brothers. And he is getting tested in the same process. How about, how can he forgive his brothers? And a part of his testing his brothers was how he could figure out a way to forgive his brothers. Okay, so this is a very interesting time. Very interesting time of testing. Uh, also, there's something else in here. Because if, if, the, if the, the years of famine and the years of blessing are symbolic of the great tribulation together, then let's make it the second year of the tribulation, just before the great tribulation. What's going to end up happening is a protection for Israel. Well, the same protection is going to be offered to Israel during the great tribulation. It says that they're given wings like an eagle to fly off in, in the book of Revelation. So there's a protection now that's going to come eventually to Israel because of Joseph being there and preparing the way. God sent him there. Even though he suffered and everything at the hands of his brothers, it was turned around for the good. Okay, so he starts testing his brothers. And he finds out the welfare of his family without revealing who he was, that he was one of the brothers, that he, was, that he is Joseph. Okay, so he uh, he tricks them. He, he puts a uh, he. They were paying him money to to get grain, right? So he gives them the grain. He sends them back. He keeps one of them there. First, he put them all there in prison for I think for three days. Okay, and then and then he they're all talking while they're in prison. They're saying hey, this is happening to us because of what we did to Joseph and. And he was right there listening, and he couldn't contain it. He had to go somewhere because he was weeping because of the pain he had. He, he wanted to be with his family, regardless of how they treated him. So he saw that there was truly some remorse there, and it saddened him. And then three days later, he lets them all go. He puts the money back in their sacks. So, you know, he goes, and, it, and they go back, and they have to... It, it was a test. If what you're saying is true, uh, he first accused them of stealing from Egypt or wanting to steal from Egypt. His, the brothers. This is the part of the test. Okay. And, and what ended up happening was he he would let them go. And when they heard the story about what happened to his brother, his younger brother Benjamin, what happened to Yosef, although he didn't reveal he was Yosef. That he he sent them back, and when they were sent back, the goal, the deal was you bring back your younger brother Benjamin back here with you, and I'll release. He took one of the brothers, Simeon, and he put him in prison, or they told them that he was putting them in prison. So basically, they had to go away, take food to their families, 
back to Israel, and then they were to come back with their younger brother, with Benjamin. Benjamin, okay? And this was the test, and then they would get Simeon back. Well, Simeon was treated very well while he was in Egypt. They go away, and they eventually, you know, Jacob said, okay, I'll send them, but don't bring my, my hairs to the grave, you know, my gray hair. You know, he says, I, I, I can't imagine if you took Benjamin after losing Joseph. Remember, he loved Raquel, and these are the two sons of Raquel. He loved Raquel the most, so, so if he lost Benjamin, it would have been too much for his father. So they come back, and uh, and things are about to happen. He, he's about to reveal himself, and that's where the portion ends. Next week is when he reveals himself to his brothers. Okay, but there's something that I wanted to share about at the at the very end about Benjamin. We're on page seven of the notes. First of all, he gave. When, because they were worried about that money that ended up back in the, in the sacks, they, they were worried that there was a mistake made and that they would be in trouble. So Jacob gave them other stuff to take to that leader, to the one who they didn't know was Yosef. They brought, they gave them balsam, they gave them honey, and they gave them wax, and they gave them uh, lotus, pistachios, and almonds. Now, you might just like say, okay, that's interesting. He gave them all this stuff. This is the best of the land, but there's meanings to every one of this. What was the balsam represent? The balsam represents medicine. It also means it's used to crack by pressure, okay? And honey, it means to be gummy, okay? I don't get much out of honey, okay? Wax literally means to be stricken, scourged, scourged, and smitten. Okay. Lotus is symbolic of a protective covering. Um, pistachios are symbolic of hunger and need from the womb, womb being met. In other words, something in the belly, uh, the, a, a symbolic of hunger and something in the belly. And almonds represent to wait, to watch, to be alert, like the sound of the shofar, okay? So putting it all together, this is the meaning of what, of what Yaakov sent with the brothers, including Benjamin, back to Egypt. Messiah will come with healing, preaching wisdom. He will be stricken, scourged, and smitten. We will then have a covering, and all of our hunger and needs will be met that hole in our heart for a relationship with Elohim will be filled. Our spirit through the Holy Spirit will come alive and we will walk in resurrection power. And at the end will come the resurrection of the dead and living believers. That's, that's what I got out of all those items that were sent with Yaakov to give to Yosef. Yosef is all those things. Jesus, Yeshua, is all those things to us. Okay, what does Benjamin mean? Son of the right hand. Son of the right hand. Okay, so Yosef has to test, uh, test his brothers, but who was not guilty? Who was not guilty in that whole mess of what his brothers did to him? Benjamin, he was only seven years old. Maybe, I think at least seven. He was not guilty. So when he saw his brother, it, 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 like he couldn't contain himself, he had to go away because he, he would have shown who he was to his brothers. There's a time to reveal everything. He is the revealer of secrets. Secrets. Revealer of secrets. Zaphonat Panem. Okay, so, um, so, so, you know, basically what was happening here is Benjamin is getting a special treatment. He gets five times as much food at this meal right before he's about to reveal himself to his brothers. Five times. Why? Five is grace. There's grace given to his brother Benjamin. Son of my right hand. 
who all of us as, as Jews who believe in Messiah, we are his immediate brother, Yeshua. Okay, and I'm not trying to say myself better than anybody else. Actually, all of you who become believers in Messiah are joined to Israel. But I want you to see something. Benjamin represents the Messianic Jews. At the very end, they did not, because his blood covers them, they are no longer the ones persecuting Jesus today. So they become the brother Benjamin. So something is going to happen, and we're going to find out next week. Yehuda is going to is going to uh, speak on behalf of his brother Benjamin. Jews, Yehuda, Jews come from Yehuda, Judah, and the Jews are against the Messianic believers today. But something has to change. If this pattern that was given to Joseph is going to be fulfilled in our time, then the Jews have got to soften their heart toward the Messianic believers, which is what Benjamin represents. So this is what me, me and Josh discovered this many years ago. And we've come to realize that this is what we pray for. This is what we want. It's time that the Jews are going to have to at least recognize that we are their brothers at some point. And it's going to be very soon near their salvation, the salvation of the entire nation of Israel when that happens. Josh, is there something you want to add to it? Actually, there's kind of a lot of things I can Well, not too much, just something. Um, well, I mean, going, going into it, bring up at first that, that it was two years into the famine and you're you're bringing it together where everything is at the, the two and a half year mark pretty much right and then you have uh shimon who is who's put into prison with with joseph already now at right. and and everything that's going on there like there's there's a whole story in itself there. No, I just want you to comment about Benjamin. Benjamin, um, going to it. Um, Benjamin, um, he he basically he's he's held as 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 a his banner is a wolf. Yeah, uh, just uh, ben, ben, Benjamin. Later we will find out his banner is a wolf. Go ahead. Um, which most believers that trust in Yeshua were were all looked at as as wolves in sheep's clothing. Yeah. Um, because because they they don't uphold the Messiah as Messiah. Um, well, just just real quick, do you know that the Jews don't hate Christians? They don't hate Gentiles. They don't hate Christians. They don't hate Jews, and they don't hate any denomination of Jews. But they hate Messianic Jews. Yeah. Yes. Um, but something else that's really interesting is that with with, with everything that we're talking about in mind, um, Joseph's brother Benjamin, it, it means son of the right hand, and because we believe in Yeshua, we also become sons of the right hand. Right. Because we, we believe in Yeshua. Yeshua is brother. at the right hand of God. And and because we because even though everything that's going on is going on, the Jews still technically will protect us. But something that's interesting is that you're mentioning about how how the days go by, and he's giving them so many things. Like I caught so many things out of out of uh, out of the, the the fruits and everything that that Joseph gave them. Right. Now, you got to realize this whole activity that was given from Joseph to his brothers had to do with Benjamin, and it's important to understand this because God knows the suffering that we suffer at the hands of our family. Yeshua said, I didn't come to bring a sword to divide nations. I came to bring a sword that divides families. This is the sword that we, this is, this is what we carry, that we lose our families. Now, I know many of you have encountered the same thing when you have left your family. Maybe some of you have. Okay, the rejection, the isolation. And that's what we're talking about here. God is remembering, he remembers all of us. And he, he's, his biggest thing that he's going to do is bring us back in unity with our brothers, with the Jews. Go ahead. Um, something else about Benjamin is, is they are master archers. 
Well, that, that would be a whole other story. Let me get into the story of the bow and arrows. <laughs> that, that I didn't get to touch on, so. <laughs> well, so although, can, can I bring up one more thing? Yeah, go ahead. And, and although it's going to seem a little bit like backtracking, I've never seen this until now. Um, and I think we may have even brought it up beforehand. Um, you brought up the butcher and the, and the wine the, the wine bearer, the cup bearer. Uh -huh. And it's interesting that, that it was the butcher who was also the, the bread maker. He got hung because bread is a picture of sin. Actually, it wasn't really, it wasn't uh, the butcher, it was the bread maker and, yeah. and the cup bearer. Yeah. Well, yeah, they were, in, they were in the house of the butcher, I'm sorry. Right. Think about um, it, it was the bread and the wine. And it was the and bread the, and the wine that were being tested at that point. Yeah. And the bread, and the bread is, a, is a picture of, uh, of the flesh, and the wine is a picture of blood. Right. And both of them had the same dream, and it was also in three days. That's true. There was three. Means basically, they were told in three days from this point where they had the dream, you're either going to be restored if, if you were the cupbearer, or you're going to be hung if you're the the, the uh, bread bread maker. Yeah, go ahead. And but wait, uh, Mary has something. Go ahead. No, let him go. Okay, go ahead, Josh. And something that's interesting is that the it was the cupbearer that was brought forth to to be restored. In the same way, our flesh has to die, but by the Spirit and by the blood of Yeshua, we are restored to our rightful place with the King. Did you repeat that again? <laughs> our flesh must be put to death. And how's that? Um, because we believe in Yeshua. But how's that related to the story? How is that related? Well, it's related because that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the change in the brothers. And even as right. even as okay. it's coming forth, it's you know, because because Yeshua always wants to forgive and pardon everybody. That's love. That's the way that love is. Yes. But he wants to know that you want that love back. And he wants to know how far will you go to not do it again. Well, remember what Yeshua told to that woman who they were gonna stone? That that uh, they brought up a woman who was caught in adultery. And they were all going to stone her, but he started writing in the <laughs> in the sand. We don't know. Actually, I don't think it was sand. He was literally writing in marble. Okay, and that probably is what freaked people out. People out. Okay, but what was he writing? I think he was writing each of their sins in there on the on, on the on the marble. Okay, so in other words, <laughs> you know, he was showing them their own sins. So they all began to leave and. And there was no one accuser. But what did he say to that woman? He said, "Where are your accusers?" And you know, and, and he said, oh, "Well, you know, I don't accuse you either." But he said, "Go and sin no more." In other words, stop sinning. We are supposed to resist the flesh. We are supposed to not give in to the power of the flesh. Yes, God. And that's what's that's what is being said. In the story, that's how Joseph is testing his brothers. Are you still in the flesh? Do you still want to kill me? Do you want to kill my brother? Okay, go ahead, Mary. Yeah, that was good. Um, numbers are important. And how old was Jesus when he started his ministry? And how old was Joseph when he went into sure. 30. That's very good, Mary. 30 years old when Joseph was pulled up out of prison. 30 years old when Yeshua began his ministry. <laughs> That's very good. That's very good. Anything else? No, just that he's a shadow of yes. what, what's coming. And, and that's what God's always telling stories. He's a storyteller. He's the master storyteller. We are in his story, by the way. Every one of you, every one of us is in his story. So let's, uh, let's go on from the Torah portion and go on to the teaching of the last days. Last week, bring out your set of notes. It has last days on it. Last week, we covered the first part about the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Well, we're going to now go over how the statue, the head of gold, represented Babylon. Then the chest and arms of silver. This is from Daniel 2 29 and 45. The chest of arms of silver represented the next empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. The, the 
the um, third one, belly and thighs of bronze is grease. Uh, and the fourth one, the legs of iron and the feet of iron, clay are Rome. And the feet are the Arab Islam, the five Roman iron clay mints. Why? Because the word for mixed is Arab. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So basically, but do you know that the Roman Empire had two legs, one leg? Was the eastern and the other leg was the western? I think eastern was, I don't matter which leg, okay? But the western Roman Empire became Europe. The eastern Roman Empire became the Arabs, the Middle East, the Islamic Roman Empire. <laughs> that's, that's the way I put it. Okay, so uh, ultimately at some point, that mixture of flesh, clay, and iron which could be Islam in combination with Rome, the doctrines of Rome. In other words, Catholicism is where Rome started. I mean, that's that's when they mix Christianity and, and all that into, into the Roman pagan culture under Constantine. Okay, where we get all this Christmas stuff from. Okay, so I hope I didn't tear anybody's mind. Christmas is really not good. We already went over that. Okay, but um, so the, the, the iron is all the doctrines of, of paganism, Hellenism, all the stuff that came from, the, from the, the mixture of Christianity into the, into the Roman Empire. But you also have the Islam. Islam. So all of these feet made of, of clay, which is weakness and flesh. And, and iron are symbolic of the mixture of Islam and religious Roman Christianity, not true Christianity, religious Roman Christianity, and also probably a form of religious Judaism. It's going to combine all the religions together into one new world religion. And it's going to be an unholy mixture, and it's going to be mixed with flesh, and it's going to be crushed, according to the, the prophecy in Daniel chapter 2, 29 to 45 of the statue. Okay, now let's go on, on page 2. I, I don't know if we'll get this finished. If not, I'll finish it tonight. <laughs> okay, so uh, Daniel chapter 7, 1 to 12. Daniel, almost the entire book, is, is connected to Hanukkah. It's right after Ezekiel, it's the last of the big prophets. Daniel 7, 1 to 12. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. And he wrote the dream down. To, it's funny, we're talking about dreams, right? All this bit, these story books are a bit about dreams, right? And we, he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion. Now remember, Babylon chose the lion as symbolic of, of, of their empire. So this is going to be elements of Babylon, like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until the wings were plucked. And it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a human mind was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear. Well, the symbolic nature of the Medo-Persian Empire is the bear. So uh, another beast, a second one resembling a bear, and it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, that thou art much meat. After this, I kept looking, and behold, another one like a leopard. Well, guess who the leopard is in Balaam? Like Greece, the leopard, which had in its back four wings of a bird. Remember, there were also four horns. I maybe mean, haven't come up, come, covered the horns yet, but four horns come out of the the horn that is uh, the beast that, that goes upon. You know, I'm getting ahead of myself. 
Just what we'll, can we'll make the connection in a moment? Four generals. Huh? Four generals, yes, four generals. Okay. Had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. What does that tell you? Rome, right? And it devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns, remember? Ten toes, okay? So we're still in the time of the Romans, believe it or not. That's why Roman teaching and doctrines have filled the church and has filled a, a lot of, even Islam is, is considered Rome. So it's a part of Rome too. Its doctrines fill the world. Okay, so, um, see, all these are, it had 10 horns. Now while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it, and behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth, uttering great boasts. And I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, and his vesture was like white snow, and his hair like on his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him, and thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were open. And I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which that little horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given over to burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for the appointed period of time. What appointed period of time? The end. The, the time at the very end. The beginnings at Rosh Hashanah at Yom Teruah, the beginning of the seven years of tribulation, and beginning with tribulation and ending with great tribulation. Okay, so, the, the horn was speaking, and and he said that the beast, their dominion was taken away. Whose dominion was taken away? The dominion of Babylon, the, the dominion of Medo-Persia, the dominion of Greece was taken away, but the fourth one, his dominion wasn't taken away. Rome, okay, Rome was not taken away, but it was extended because it has to come to the fullness at the end. <laughs> I kept looking in the night visions. Okay, and actually I'm gonna stop reading at that point and go to verse 17. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings that will arise from the earth. And the saints of the highest one, that's all the believers, will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, of which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and the meaning of the ten horns that were in its head, and the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boast and which was larger in appearance than its associates. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the believers and overpowering them. Okay, I've told you twice. He is going to kill the believers. That is his, the last great act of the believers is to die. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, or the holy ones, and the time arrived when the, the believers took possession of the kingdom. And then I, thus I said, thus he said, the fourth beast will be the fourth kingdom in the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise and another, and another will arise after them. And he will be different from the previous ones and he will subdue three kings. So he will control three kings at first. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the believers, the saints, the holy ones, the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and the law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Three and a half years. Now what will he do? He will make alterations in the appointed times, the festivals, the calendar. That's why we need to know the calendar. Because he will come and try to get rid of it. Throw it to the ground, mistreat it. 
because he's at war with God. It doesn't say that he's at war with us. It says he's at war with God. He's boastful against God himself. And his, uh, his whole idea is to trample down the times of God and the law. Why does it want to trample down so much? Why are we not taking it serious that those belong to us, that we need to be observant of those? Because, because we've been following Roman teachings in the church, and we're not following God's, God's uh, appointed times and his, his law, his Torah. And it's the believers are the ones that we're going to be dying because we will not put up with the war that's against the appointed times and, and the law. And they will give it into his hands, the believers, for a time, times in heaven. They will kill us for three and a half years. The last three and a half years, the great tribulation. But the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms of the, under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the believers or the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. At this point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts are greatly alarming me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to my to myself. Okay. So let's just quickly talk about it. I already told you the beast with the that was like a lion, eagles with eagle wings, was Babylon. We're in the notes, top of page two. A beast like a bear raised up on one side with three ribs between the seats, Medo-Persia. The beast like a leopard with four wings and four heads, Greece. A fourth beast with large iron teeth and ten horns. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. And I already, I, I, we already read those scriptures. Ten kings will come out of them. The ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's images are the same as the ten horns or kings of Daniel's vision. Okay, so... Daniel has another vision, okay? Chapter 8, 1 to 4. Okay, all this that I'm sharing with you is to prepare you to know how events in the world are going to happen, to be watchful and to understand so that it won't take you by surprise, so that you'll know to be prepared when these things happen. So Daniel, chapter 8, 1 to 4. I should have closed the book. Okay. And the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king of vision appeared to me. That's Belshazzar. I think that's the king of Babylon. Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and I myself was besides the Ulai Canal. And I lifted up my eyes, and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns, was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, and the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to end rescue from his power, but he did as he pleased and magnified himself. Okay, the ram with two horns is the Medo-Persian Empire. One horn longer because the Persians were greater than the Medes. You all, do you all understand that? Okay, the ram. Okay, it is in Hebrew, it's I, I yield, actually means prominence. The ram with two high horns, one higher than the other, that came up last or second, was pushing westward, northward, southward, so that no animal could withstand it. In other words, according to the meaning of the animal here, it's really saying no one would live who came against him. The ram of two horns is the kings of Medea and Persia. Now, I've been sharing for a long time, but not consistently. I have a teaching on the kosher laws. But really, what it's about is the meaning of all the animals. If you understand what the animals mean, you can understand what, what all this is about. Okay, that's why, you know, God wants us to be studiers of the word, to approve, be approved unto God, who, who study the scriptures. Study to show yourself approved unto God. And then you'll be more aware, you'll be more understanding, you'll know what's going on. Okay, it's important to know what's going on. Okay, so let's go to verses 5 and 6. Daniel chapter 8, 5 and 6. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. Now what would that be? If you're moving without touching the ground, that means you're above the ground. 
Well, how would that be today? And I said levitating. <laughs> now, how about an airplane? Or a helicopter, where you're not touching the ground and you're moving, okay? So a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came up to the ram that had the two horns, which, which I had seen standing in front of the canal and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. And I saw, okay, you know, I'm gonna stop right there. Remember I told you the prophecy is now and in the future. Prophecy was given to Daniel what was gonna happen in his days, but there's gonna be characteristics of these things happen at the end. Keep that in mind. Okay, the next kingdom, the kingdom of Greece, the male goat came from the west. It had a notable horn between its eyes. The male goat with one horn is Greece. The one horn is the first king, which is Alexander the Great of Greece. You all hear about in your storybooks, right? I mean storybooks, history books. The, the goat is also called a goat demon. <laughs> but uh, he had a notable horn. In other words, there was something prophetic about him. That's what it means, a notable horn. Horn is a power of strength. With furious power, the male goat attacked the ram and broke his two horns. In other words, Greece destroyed, they, they came, they were under Alexander, they destroyed Judea and Persia, okay? The ram was trampled to the ground with furious power, furious heat, rage, inhumation, and strength. Okay, Daniel 8, 7. I saw him come beside him, the ram, and he was enraged at him, and he struck the ram and chattered its two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came a four conspicuous horn toward the four winds of heaven. Now remember, what happened when Alexander died? He gave his power to four kings. These are the four horns, okay? One of them, now he's talking about one of the four horns. One of, of the four horns came forth, no, I'm sorry, out of one of, of the four horns came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. When it says beautiful land, it means Israel. Who was that small horn? His name was Antiochus. Antiochus Epiphanes. The bad guy in the story of the Maccabees. This that happened with the Maccabees was prophetically foretold in Daniel. So here's the question. Why are we celebrating Christmas? When all these things in Hanukkah are prophetic. And we should be getting ready and learning from them. Okay, so Hanukkah is what we should be observing. To understand the end and be ready. Okay, I, I grew uh, it grew up to the host of heaven and called some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host and it removed the regular sacrifice from him and in the place of sanctuary was thrown down. Now Look at this. Remember? Twofold prophecy. It happened then with the Maccabees. But what he's talking about, that didn't happen then. He says he magnified himself to be equal with the commander of the host. That is God himself. Although maybe he did it in his own heart. Antiochus. Okay? So what I'm basically telling you here, there's a future fulfillment of this. It says here that the regular sacrifices were stopped. And under Antiochus, they stopped the regular sacrifice. They put, he put an image of Zeus on the altar and replaced the head with his head. With Antiochus, replaced the head of Zeus with his head. And it was called the abomination of desolation. Okay, um. On the account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice. And get this, and this horn will fling, we're in verse 12 of chapter 8. This horn will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. What truth? 
the Torah will fling it to the ground. That Torah will be thrown on the ground. That's what this guy does. That's what Antiochus does. That's what the Antichrist does. We better be in that word. Yeshua said, if we stand upon the rock, heaven and earth will, will cease, but my word will not pass away. So we better be in that word. We better be found loving it, not just reading it, not being religious about it, but loving it and seeing it as Yeshua, as who he is. Okay, so he'll fling truth to Then I heard a holy one speaking, another holy one said to the particular one who was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply when the transgression causes horror so to allow the holy place of the host to be trampled? He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Okay, now, let's go down a little bit. We're on page four. Okay, we're on the second paragraph down. The vision from the regular sacrifice. It's 2,300 total evening and mornings. He wasn't talking about 2,300 days. It says evening and morning sacrifices. The Jews say it's 2,300 evening and morning sacrifices. In other words, 1,150 days, which is three years and two months. These are regular sacrifices, tamid, shemot, uh, from, from uh, Exodus, 29, 38 to 42. One in the morning and one in the evening. The regular sacrifices were counted up to 2,300. Not the days for 1,150 1, days. We don't know how the exact date in Maccabees as to when Antiochus stopped the sacrifices, but we do have a year, and it is 168 BC. Okay, now, I just, I found this out this week, and I never knew it, but the abomination of desolation the event that happened after the sacrifices were stopped. We don't know exactly when the sacrifices were stopped, but we know the abomination. We know when that was, where he put the idol up on the altar. That happened on Christmas, and we found out that Christmas fell, the 25th day of, of December fell on Kislev 25, when he put the idol up on the altar. So I just tell you that December 25th, and everything about the connection of December 25th is connected to the abomination of desolation. Okay. So just you know, just let you know that this when it happened here, anyhow. Okay, so three years later when the Maccabees cleansed the temple, it happened at a different date. It, we, we know it was Kislev 25, but but it wasn't the same day. Remember, the Jewish calendar is different every year. Okay. Okay. So, anyhow, let's let's uh, let's go on. The first pig was sacrificed on the altar on the twenty-fifth day of Kislev in the year one sixty-eight BC, which is also the same day that year as December twenty-fifth. Okay. Daniel 8, 23 to 27. Uh, I think we'll stop after this. And we'll finish, probably finish it all, all up tonight. Okay, 23 to 27. Daniel chapter 8, 23 to 27. In the latter period of their rule, it's talking about the Greeks and the four kingdoms of the Greeks. We're going to talk about what they are in a moment. In the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. He will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause the seed to succeed by his influence. He will magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many while they are at ease. In other words, when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. He will even oppose the prince of princes. Well, who's the prince of princes? Yeshua. 
So we know this is the end. And he will be broken without human agency. In other words, no humans will be able to do it. Okay, 26. A vision of the evenings and mornings which have been told is true, but keep the vision secret for it pertains to many days. Uh, many days in the future, that is. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up again and carried on the king's business as I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. Okay, so... In the latter time of the kingdom, when the transgressions have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. Well, I want to look that up. Sinister schemes is the word chidya, or chida, or chida. Uh, it, it, it's root word, it literally means riddle or difficult question, a parable, an enigmatic saying or question. Its root word is chud. Uh, to propose a riddle, profound riddle. Now, what does that mean? He's going to appear as someone who is wise. Someone who knows it all, who knows all the answers. And that's how he will deceive. Someone who, in sinister schemes, is they know deep teachings, deep things. So we've got to be careful about what we know. It's, it's, it's the heart that matters. Okay? So this will be his deception. This will be how he deceives people. He's a peacemaker through deception. Okay. Now, let's go to the top of page five, and we'll stop after this. Male goat with horn between his eyes became great. Alexander the Great, Greece Empire, the large herd broke into four horns. Four generals after Alexander, four kingdoms came from him. General Cassander, who ruled over Macedonia and Greece. General Lysimachus, Thrace and Bithynia. General Seleucus, later forced out by Antigonus. He was over Syria, Babylonia, Central Asia, Asia Minor. And General Ptolemy, it was out of him who came Antiochus. And he was called Ptolemy Lagi. Each of Palestine, including Israel, or Philistine, actually, Arabia, Pateria, assisted by the Seleucid, another general. They were pretty much all in agreement, but this guy went off. Later in generations, he became a really bad horn. So that's where we'll end for today on this. What's the point of this? The point is getting ready. Okay, what did the Maccabees have to do? They were, they were mistreated and abused. They stood against what everybody was trying to get them to, to get them to sacrifice a pig on the altar, get them to throw away the Torah, to stop circumcising their children, their male children at eight days old. They were bringing every, everything in the word of God. They were breaking it all. Okay, they forbid the study of Torah. They forbid people from knowing the truth. Okay, so, so this is what we have to stand against. They stood up against even at the risk of their lives. They lost a lot of, there were a lot of lives of Judah, Judah Maccabee. He was the one in charge of it. And people lost their lives because they wanted to stand up for God. They did not want to, 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 to lose their soul by going away from Torah. Well, guess what? That is a shadow of the end. Are we going to stand up for Yeshua, Torah? Yeshua is the Torah. Are we going to stand up for him even when it means we'll lose our lives? That's what being a Maccabee is about. To, to not give in to false teaching, to not go away from the Torah, to, to stand up for God because you love him and you know his way is truth and every Thing else is a lie. That's what it is. And that's what we need to all be ready to do. Do not compromise with the enemy. See, the problem was there was many Jews that said, let's compromise. And those Jews are called Hellenists. Hellenists, followers of the ways of Greece. Okay, and they were trying to, to, to get all the rest of the Jews in Israel to turn away from, from the God of Israel too. They use their own people. You know, one of the worst 
some of the worst Jews that ever were, were in Nazi Germany. The Nazis would hire Jews who cared nothing about their faith to turn in their fellow Jews. They are the same type of people as these Hellenists. And anyhow, so, so this, is, this is the season that we're in. This is the battle that we're in. The temptation is great, but we can't give in. We can't, we, we got to have our eyes focused on the Lord, focused on his word, on his kingdom, and get ready and get prepared. That's what this whole festival is about. It's not about candles. It's not about oil. It, it is about rejoicing because what happened was a few people overcame this large Greek army. They had victory. What is that a shadow of? That Judah Maccabee and his group ended up taking the city of Jerusalem back and Israel back against an overwhelmingly large Greek army. How is that possible? Because it is a shadow of the believers at the end who will rule and reign with the Messiah. And it says the weakest among them, the feeblest among them will be like David in that day. That's the kind of zeal and fire God wants in us. To stand that much for him, even if it means losing our lives, but ultimately saving our souls. What is it to have the whole word? Yeshua said, what is it to have everything and lose your soul? What is it to have all these things? They're all going to pass away. Abba, in the name of Yeshua, Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you just help us, Lord, to understand, Lord, that to learn your ways, to be prepared for the end. Abba, everything that you gave to Daniel and everything that happened in history, Lord, is a lesson for us to learn. Even as believers, we do not follow the flesh. Abba, we are weak at times. We fall. But Lord, you're able to, we're able to get back up with your help, with your strength, Abba. That's what it truly means to be holy. Abba, that we can recover. That sin doesn't beat us down. As Yeshua told the woman, Lord, that uh, was an adultery. Go and sin no more. You're always pouring grace out on us, Lord. When we fall, you always pick us back up. Even if we fall seven times, Lord, you pick us up seven times. If we fall 490 times a day, you pick us up. Help us also to forgive those that sin against us because they don't even know that they're sinners themselves. And Lord, I just ask that you just help us all to be ready in this hour to stand up and, and, and not be manipulated, not be given in to the, the spirits of this age, of this world, Abba, that's passing away. Abba, but to stand upon the rock in the name of Yeshua. Let's do the closing.